Good morning and welcome to today's presentation, The Heart of AFib, Risk Prevention and Treatment. My name is Dr. Paul Wong and I'm director of the Stanford Cardiac Arrhythmia Service, a cardiac electrophysiologist and a professor at Stanford University School of Medicine, and I'm honored to be your host. Thank you for inviting us into your home or from wherever you may be joining us. I'm glad to see from the registration so many friends who have joined us before, welcome and a warm welcome to our new friends, those joining us for the first time. If you've attended one of our events before, I want you to know that this event will be just a little different in this virtual format. Stay tuned and you'll find out. Today, my colleagues and I will share information on atrial fibrillation or AFib. We'll speak to you about what it, it is We'll discuss the results of new medical procedures that we at Stanford Medicine have been using with great success. And I'll, we'll share some lifestyle practices that you can employ to prevent and manage it. We all know this is a unique time with so many challenges and uncertainties. Even during the pandemic, I want to remind you that your heart care remains essential. February is heart month, so it's a great time to make your heart health a priority. Today is all about AFib, which is the most common heart rhythm problem affecting 2 million people. Today, we've brought together some of the best doctors in the field of medicine and surgery. Together, we will educate you about AFib and treatment options, provide you with the confidence to make good decisions about your care and answer your important questions. This virtual event is broken into a series of topics to provide you with the information you need to know about AFib and what you can do starting today. Our first speaker will be my colleague, Dr. Anurag Gupta, our cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist. Dr. Gupta is going to provide an overview of atrial fibrillation, including identifying the signs and symptoms of AFib, medication, and minimally invasive therapies. Following Dr. Gupta, I'll be sharing a bit more in depth about AFib and catheter ablation and hybrid surgical catheter ablation. Our next speaker will be Dr. James Longoria, a cardiothoracic surgeon and associate professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Longoria is going to speak about concomitant atrial fibrillation surgery and when you should consider this surgery as a next step in treating your AFib. Then we'll hear from Dr. Anson Lee, an assistant professor at Stanford University School of Medicine and cardiothoracic surgeon who specializes in the surgical treatment of abnormal heart rhythms. Dr. Lee will share how hybrid treatments can treat heart disease with minimally invasive techniques. And we have a special treat for you. One of Dr. Longorio's patients is joining us to share his journey from being when he unexpectedly discovered he had an AFib to being cured. Our final presenter today is Dr. Melissa Burroughs, our cardiologist who specializes in preventive cardiology. She'll discuss how taking a holistic approach and looking at patients' lifestyles can aid in the prevention and management of AFib and heart disease. And lastly, one of my favorites, we're going to bring you all the doctors on live with us to address your questions at the end of the session. Let us know your, your questions by typing them in the chat box on the right. If you don't see it, try minimizing your screen. There'll be a lot of detailed information shared today. And that's our goal, to share information that will empower you to make the important steps for you or someone you care about, about dealing with AFib or needs to be prepared and aware of it. Now, in the interest of time, today's presentations have been pre-recorded. However, all of our doctors will join us live to answer your questions during the Q&A session at the end of all the presentations. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. If you have a question during the presentations, please use the chat box to the right of your screen. Our team will collect your questions and send them to us. And we'll, we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A session. The depending on the number of questions, we may go a little over time. So we hope you'll be able to stay with us until the end. 
If you're interested in assistance with scheduling an appointment or learning about the many programs available to you through our Stanford Medicine Network throughout the Bay Area and beyond, please connect, click the Connect With Us button below this video. When you click the button, you'll be asked to complete a simple form and one of our team members will be in touch with you in the coming days. Okay, let's get started. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Anurag Gupta, who will provide an overview of atrial fibrillation and medications that can be used in managing AFib. Good morning. My name is Dr. Anurag Gupta, and I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist at Stanford Healthcare. Again, I wanted to thank everyone for sharing some of their Saturday morning to learn about atrial fibrillation. Today, I'm gonna to provide a brief overview of what atrial fibrillation is and what some of the medications to treat it are. What is atrial fibrillation? Remember, your heart fundamentally is a pump. It is pumping blood to the rest of your body. It consists of four main chambers. The upper chambers are called the atrium, which receive blood from the rest of the body and then send it to the muscular ventricles, the lower chambers, which pump blood to the rest of the body. Electrically, signals to when to fire the heart occur in a highly coordinated fashion. Typically, there are a group of cells called the sinus node, which live in the right atrium, that set the pace of the heart. Electrical signals originate from this area and then are transmitted in a linear coordinated fashion to the rest of the heart. Atrial fibrillation, though, is an electrical short circuit where both atrium begin misfiring rapidly and chaotically. This supersedes the normal electrical pathways. Specifically, the atrium are firing very rapidly approximately 500 beats per minute or greater. However, there's an electrical bridge called the AV node between the atrium and the ventricles, which filters out these impulses during atrial fibrillation. The result is that fewer impulses are transmitted from the atrium to the ventricles. However, because the atrium are firing so rapidly, in most people, the heart rate in atrial fibrillation is rapid and erratic. Importantly, your heart rate is determined by how fast the ventricles are firing. We discussed two typical patterns of atrial fibrillation. One is paroxysmal. Paroxysmal refers to episodes of atrial fibrillation that stop in less than one week, anywhere from minutes to hours to days. Persistent atrial fibrillation are episodes of atrial fibrillation lasting greater than one week, and they often require specific additional therapies to terminate an episode of atrial fibrillation, such as an electrical shock or cardioversion. We make this distinction because it has obvious treatment implications for our patients. Also, people with persistent atrial fibrillation tend to have more electrically diseased atrium and often require more aggressive therapies to control their atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is common, and unfortunately, it's only getting more common. The prevalence or the amount of people in the United States with atrial fibrillation is in the millions and increasing. The incidence or the amount of people who develop atrial fibrillation each year is also high and higher in people who are older. Roughly, it is estimated that about one in four individuals in the United States will develop atrial fibrillation at some point in their lifetime. One of the most feared risks with atrial fibrillation is stroke. Untreated, the rate of stroke in atrial fibrillation per year is about 5%. And compared to people without atrial fibrillation, individuals who have atrial fibrillation have an approximately two to seven times higher risk of stroke. Also, atrial fibrillation is associated with other risks, including death. However, the expectation is if atrial fibrillation is treated properly, people will have a good quality of life and normal longevity. Who is at risk of developing atrial fibrillation? One of the biggest risk factors for atrial fibrillation is age. We remind our patients that aging is a good thing and we want them to get older. However, it does change the electrical properties of the heart and makes atrial fibrillation more common. Also, family history can be relevant in some people with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a very complex disease and there are many other medical conditions that are associated with increased risk of atrial fibrillation, including high blood pressure, diabetes, excess alcohol, excess weight, other heart conditions such as prior heart attacks or weakening of the heart and other. As we discussed, we see atrial fibrillation in all age groups. We take care of people with atrial fibrillation in their 30s to 40s and sometimes younger. 
However, statistically, most people with atrial fibrillation, as represented by the green bars in this graph, looking at people with atrial fibrillation at different ages, is in people in their 60s to 80s. What are the symptoms of atrial fibrillation? Most commonly, people present with palpitations, which just refers to an abnormal awareness of your heartbeat. For example, erratic beating, rapid beating, or accentuated beating. However, there's a whole array of symptoms people sometimes experience in atrial fibrillation, including dizziness, or in some extreme cases, loss of consciousness, shortness of breath, chest discomfort, and reduced energy. For example, lower capacity with normal activities or exercise. Importantly though, one of the most common symptoms in atrial fibrillation is no symptoms. Many of our patients have no awareness of their atrial fibrillation and it gets incidentally diagnosed during a medical contact for other reasons. The degree that people have symptoms in atrial fibrillation largely determines how aggressive we are with some of the treatments. What are the treatments for atrial fibrillation? Some of our patients recognize that there are certain circumstances where they're more prone to developing atrial fibrillation. For example, if they're dehydrated, if they're tired, if they have excess stress, or other conditions. In those people, we often try to ameliorate those circumstances so they're less prone to atrial fibrillation. However, we remind people that atrial fibrillation is a complicated disease with an electrical basis, and addressing these risk factors is not sufficient for controlling it in most people. Also, many people have atrial fibrillation without clear inciting episodes or triggers. What are the medical treatments for atrial fibrillation? As we discussed, the most feared complication of atrial fibrillation is stroke. This graph shows in the yellow bars at different age groups with different risk factors, the rate of stroke per year if atrial fibrillation is not treated and ranges roughly from three to 9%. However, in appropriate candidates, blood thinning medication significantly reduces that risk. This graph here shows again in blue with warfarin in appropriate people, the rates of stroke being much lower. Fortunately, there are multiple new medications over the years to reduce risk of stroke, um, including blood thinning medications, dabigatran or pradaxa, rivaroxaban or Xarelto, adoxaban or Sebasa, and apixaban or Eliquis. These medications have comparable safety and efficacy compared to warfarin, if not slightly better in some circumstances, and importantly, are much more convenient to use, including fixed doses, no need for laboratory monitoring, and less drug interactions and interactions with foods. Most of our patients who require blood thinning medications are candidates for these newer blood thinners. Not everybody who has atrial fibrillation requires blood thinning medications. We use a scoring system called the chads vast score to help us decide who would benefit from stroke prevention medications. This score goes from zero to nine and includes risk factors such as high blood pressure, diabetes, age, prior stroke, and assigns scores based on how many of these risk factors you have. If you have very low predicted rate of stroke with atrial fibrillation, notably a score of zero in men or one in women, we typically don't recommend blood thinning medications given the risk versus benefits. In people with higher risk scores with higher predicted rates of stroke, typically a score of two or higher in men or three or higher in women, we do recommend blood thinning medications. Other medications used to treat atrial fibrillation include rate controlling medicines. As we discussed, some people with atrial fibrillation have rapid heart rates when they're in this arrhythmia. We give them medications to help slow down the heart rate by blocking the AV node or the connection between electrical signals from the atrium and the ventricles. You might know these medicines, which include beta blockers, such as atenolol, metoprolol, or propanolol, and others, or calcium channel blockers, such as Diltiazem and verapamil, and in some cases, we use digoxin. Again, those medicines help reduce symptoms in atrial fibrillation and reduce the strain on the heart by reducing the heart rate. Finally, in some individuals, we use antiarrhythmic drugs. These are medicines that specifically block electrical channels in the heart to reduce your risk of having an atrial fibrillation episode in the first place. We typically reserve these medicines for people who are symptomatic and not tolerating their atrial fibrillation episodes well. The goal of these medicines and other treatments, which we'll discuss later in the talk, are to reduce episodes of atrial fibrillation in people primarily who are symptomatic so they feel better. In conclusion, again, atrial fibrillation is a very common disorder. It has complex causes and is a chronic disease. Its implications and impact on patients can be widely variable. And it's critically important that we develop individualized treatment plans for people based on their experience with atrial fibrillation. 
Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for providing us with such a comprehensive overview of what AFib is, the symptoms to be aware of, its risks, and how certain medications can help reduce those risks. And, and who's our next speaker? Oh, oh it's me, actually. Uh, and I'll continue the conversation about treatment options. So what are the, some of the other things that we should consider uh, when we talk about treatments for atrial fibrillation? Well, one of those things is called catheter ablation. So what's catheter ablation? So when we talk about catheter ablation, we say that catheters are plastic tubes we insert into the body and that we find islands of cells that are responsible for the heart tissue. And by killing them, that's called ablation, we can successfully treat the, the atrial fibrillation. So when, what kind of patients should get catheter ablation? So those are people that remain symptomatic despite medications. They might have a variety of different uh, symptoms such as shortness of breath or limitation of exertion. Those would be our typical patients that will undergo catheter ablation. How do we go about doing catheter ablation? Well, we have a specific target in mind. These are the structures we call the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins connect the lungs uh, to the heart tissue, specifically the left atrium. And by targeting these areas, the pulmonary veins, we found that we could be most successful in treating patients with atrial fibrillation using catheter ablation. So the different techniques include different energy sources, we call them. So most commonly, it's one of two, radio frequency or radio waves, which heats the tissue, and then cryoablation, which freezes the tissue. These are the two most commonly used uh, techniques by far, and there are others that are available. So when we talk about success and risk and complications, how do we describe to our patients what catheter ablation is all about? So first of all, the risk of catheter ablation is relatively low. It's about one to 2% for serious complications. What about the success? Well, it's about 80% at one year for the majority of patients that have what we call paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. That means that the atrial fibrillation comes and goes on its own. It's a bit lower for patients that have persistent atrial fibrillation, namely atrial fibrillation that requires some kind of treatment such as electrical shock to the heart, we call cardioversion in order to, to convert the rhythm. We may see some atrial fibrillation early after catheter ablation, but frequently that disappears. There are some factors that can predict uh, either success or failure. And one of the things that we consider is atrial size. As the size of the atrium, particularly the left atrium gets larger, the success drops progressively. Are there other ways that we can think about approaching where to treat the atrial fibrillation? Well, this is work done by my colleague, Sandy Narayan, in which he's defined in a, a way to identify what are called rotors, areas that rotate around like spinning tops that may lead to us are finding different areas. And so that's what you see in the little movie on the left, the little bouncing red ball may give us information about where in fact uh, we can uh, identify the, the area of atrial fibrillation. And you can see in the right-hand panel, studies that he's done show that there may be ways in which we can improve the outcomes as well. What can we think about the whole range of patients that develop atrial fibrillation? Are there different techniques? Are there different patient characteristics that may require different approaches? So as you see here in this slide, there are some patients that have relatively normal or small atria and have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation as we show on the top uh, part of this slide. Then progressively more advanced atrial fibrillation. So that in fact, patients may have atrial fibrillation for long periods of time. That is continuously for one year or more, what we call long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. And in fact, their atria may be uh, quite enlarged. For those people, we say they have the most advanced atrial fibrillation, the more, most progressed. So there may be different techniques that we'll wanna use for these patients. So one thing that my colleagues here today will be telling you about is another option. We call this hybrid surgical catheter ablation. 
Why do we consider this approach? Well, this approach combines a thoracoscopic approach with this catheter ablation approach that we've described to you. And we believe this results in higher degrees of success. One other very important question that we always ask about atrial fibrillation is, can we prevent atrial fibrillation? How can I reduce the risk of developing atrial fibrillation? Well, there are a number of conditions you see listed here that have major roles in increasing the rate at which people develop atrial fibrillation. So as you see, they may include high blood pressure or hypertension, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity or increased weight, sleep apnea, stress, or alcohol and smoking. So th this gives us some insight, and this is what we see in this approach, which is a multi-prong approach, looking at various different elements, things that we need to target. So weight management and exercise, treating elevated lipids, one's glucose tolerance, one's blood pressure, and then sleep apnea, as well as tobacco and alcohol use. By using a comprehensive approach, we feel we can significantly improve the outcomes of our patients. So I'd like to share with you some of the data that we have that supports this idea that there we can impact uh, how much atrial fibrillation people have. This slide shows on its panel, what is the impact of weight loss on atrial fibrillation recurrence? On the left-hand panel labeled A, this is without ablation or drugs, but we see the patient who has been more successful in weight loss in the red line has a better outcome, meaning fewer recurrences in the other groups of patients who have less ability or have not lost as much weight. Similarly, in the panel B, we see patients that are on have had ablation or on medications that the red line people who have in fact had more weight loss also have a better outcome. And this is true uh, as you look at patients that have had a atrial fibrillation ablation, uh, the patients that in fact uh, have the ability to have these risk factors modified have better outcomes. What other approaches are there? And so this is a study that was done looking at patients who uh, were obese who had bariatric surgery, that is surgery designed for weight loss specifically, and compared it to patients who didn't receive that treatment. So what were the different outcomes? You can see here that the line in which uh, the patients had bariatric surgery, uh, in addition to atrial fibrillation ablation, had very similar outcomes, that is better outcomes than those people who are non-obese, compared to the line, the green line, in which they in fact were obese but did not have bariatric surgery and had atrial fibrillation alone. This leads us to believe that in fact, there may be some benefit to having a combination of bariatric surgery and atrial fibrillation ablation. And we in fact are leading a study worldwide in which we're, uh, we're looking at this question. This is called the Bar Barrow Study, Bariatric Atrial Restoration of Sinus Trial, a multi-center trial in which patients are randomized in having atrial fibrillation ablation alone or a combination of bariatric surgery and atrial fibrillation ablation. There are other programs uh, at Stanford, including atrial fibrillation risk modification, many of the conditions we've talked about today, the role of mindfulness, and this is led by our uh, colleague, Dr. Linda Adaboni. So what are the take home messages from our uh, talk today? First of all, we have the ability to improve symptoms just by controlling the rate of the a heart, how fast the pulse is going. We can make people feel better in most cases. When we add medications, we call antiarrhythmic agents. These also improve symptoms and decrease the likelihood of atrial fibrillation ablation. And then atrial fibrillation ablation, or what we've gone on to describe to you called a hybrid surgical catheter ablation may further decrease the likelihood of symptomatic recurrences for these patients that remain symptomatic despite using these medications. Also, we stress the great importance of anticoagulation medications to reduce the risk of stroke at patients at increased risk. And also addressing various conditions, 
such as high blood pressure, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, sleep apnea, stress, and smoking may be very important in decreasing atrial fibrillation. So we hope you've learned a lot about atrial fibrillation today and you could use this in your own treatment. As you've heard in both Dr. Gupta and my presentation, there are steps you can take to improve symptoms and feel better. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. James Longoria, who's going to speak about concomitant atrial fibrillation surgery. Dr. Longoria will share when you should consider this surgery as the next step in treating your AFib. I wanna caution you that in this video, that this video contains an image of an actual heart. So you might wanna find that you, it's difficult to see, and you may wanna turn away during that part of the presentation. And now, Dr. Longoria. I'd like to personally thank all of you for attending our event today. In our current state of affairs, I'm certain the last thing you thought you'd be doing is attending another Zoom thing. So thank you again, for, and hopefully it'll be worth your time. I'm gonna be talking about concomitant atrial fibrillation surgery. All of you attending today either have atrial fibrillation or know someone who has the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. But before we start, I want you to imagine you're 25. 25. Remember, you could do whatever you want. Stay up all night, dancing, eating, drinking, other things. Never once did you think about your heart. And that's because atrial fibrillation is associated with aging. It's extremely rare to be diagnosed with atrial fibrillation when you're young. Now, I can't promise that you'll feel like you're 25 again, but I can promise you that if you achieve sinus rhythm, you will feel better. And that's why we're here today. So back to concomitant atrial fibrillation surgery, and what does that mean? If you have an open heart surgery, like on the left, you have atrial fibrillation, then for all intents and purposes, you should be getting the Cox maze operation to correct your atrial fibrillation. So on the left, this is your heart on the heart and lung machine, which is perhaps the greatest medical machine ever created. So what is the heart and lung machine or cardiopulmonary bypass? Basically, it allows the heart surgeon to fix the heart by removing deoxygenated blood from your body, putting it into a reservoir and pumping it through your, an artificial lung to remove carbon dioxide and adding oxygen and then returning the oxygenated blood back to the body. Or as I like to say, taking blue blood and making it red. So now what is the Cox maze operation? It was an operation devised by Dr. Jimmy Cox to correct atrial fibrillation. It really is a rarity in surgery in that it was a disease that was studied in the lab on basis of known mechanisms of atrial fibrillation and then tested in dogs and ultimately determined the feasibility of an operation and a surgical cure for atrial fibrillation in humans. And he did this in a series of papers that were published sequentially and eventually leading to the Cox maze operation. He then applied this operation and followed those patients to determine how successful it was. Basically, it had a greater than 90% success rate and extremely low risk of stroke long-term. Despite these excellent results, there weren't a lot of patients who had lone atrial fibrillation who wanted to sign up to get their chest cracked, as my friendly cardiologists like to say. But Dr. Cox had the foresight to apply the maze operation to patients that even had open heart surgery for other problems as well as atrial fibrillation. He noted that the Cox maze procedure had an equal, equal operative risk and long-term efficacy rate in patients undergoing both lone operations as well as concomitant. So basically the Cox maze procedure is making incisions and ablation lines to redirect and block aberrant electrical impulses and allowing for your natural conduction system to go down a defined pathway and restoring sinus rhythm. As I like to say, it's like a cornfield maze where you have to find the right path to get out. So if you have other surgically correctable heart problems and you're undergoing mitral valve repair, coronary bypass grafting, aortic valve surgery, double valve surgery, and you have atrial fibrillation, then this is your opportunity and your surgeon's opportunity to cure you of your atrial fibrillation. And again, if you have to have mitigating circumstances or you have to have some risk factor profile that prohibits the maze operation from being performed. The answer from the surgeon can't be, it doesn't work. I don't believe the data. You're not a good candidate. If that's the answer, then the next appropriate question from you is why? Why doesn't it work? Why don't you believe the data? Why am I not a good candidate? If you're not satisfied with the answer or the explanation, then that's your opportunity and excuse 
to seek a second opinion. If you think of your heart as having four chambers, two upper, two lower, right and left, the Cox maze operation involves incisions and ablation lines in the upper chambers. Here is a depiction of the cuts and ablation lines in the right atrium. Here's a picture of the lesion set in the left atrium. You can see that if you're having your mitral valve repaired, which is in the right upper corner, it doesn't add much to the operation to correct your atrial fibrillation. So what does the literature say? In 2014, all of the major heart societies came out with a revised consensus guideline statement for the management of patients with atrial fibrillation. This is a busy slide, but just like a traffic signal, green is go, red is stop. Where you wanna be in regard to recommendations is in the upper left-hand corner. Class one, level A, where there's a definite benefit of doing something backed by multiple clinical trials or meta-analyses. So in 2014, there were only class two level A recommendations, yellow, you know, caution, for concomitant atrial fibrillation surgery. In 2016, the European Society of Cardiology in collaboration with the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeons published their guideline paper. And patients having heart surgery and symptoms related to atrial fibrillation, again, class two, level A recommendation, yellow, caution. Remember, this is more than 25 years after Dr. Cox published his initial results. In 2017, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, which is the largest international professional society for heart surgeons, came out with our clinical practice guidelines for the surgical treatment of atrial fibrillation. And what does it say? Surgical ablation is recommended for concomitant mitral valve operations, class one, level A. Remember, upper left corner. Also, surgical ablation is recommended for concomitant aortic valve operations, coronary artery bypass grafting, aortic valve plus coronary artery bypass grafting, class one, level B almost in the upper left-hand corner. Additionally, surgical ablation is reasonable to exclude the left atrial appendage to reduce the long-term risk of stroke. They also recommended in the treatment of atrial fibrillation, a multidisciplinary heart team, similar to everyone today, which could be useful and beneficial for long-term outcomes. So let's put it all together. If you're a patient with atrial fibrillation and you're undergoing heart surgery, and you have symptoms related to atrial fibrillation, you should have a concomitant Cox maze operation. The take home message is this. The Cox maze operation for the treatment of atrial fibrillation has gone from lab to animals to patients and has over 30 years of clinical experience. It has gone from investigational to reasonable and now class one level A recommendations to be performed concomitantly if you're having heart surgery. So if you're having heart surgery and you have atrial fibrillation, the question is not, why should I get concomitant maze operation? The question is, why not? Thank you, Dr. Longoria, for that informative overview of the concomitant Cox maze procedure. It's encouraging that the Cox maze operation has a greater than 90% success and is created at extremely low risk of stroke long-term. If you're a patient undergoing heart surgery and experiencing atrial fibrillation, you should be speaking to your doctor about the concomitant Cox maze operation. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Anson Lee, who, who is going to discuss hybrid ablation, which combines minimally invasive approaches to overcome the obstacles which are present with the other heart procedures. I wanna note this, this presentation contains a picture of a heart and a recording from an actual heart procedure. So it may be difficult for some of you to watch. If you prefer to look away, it will follow the photo that shows the inside of the operating room. Thank you very much for joining us on this talk about hybrid catheter surgical ablation. It's my pleasure to give a brief overview of this treatment modality. There are some limits to catheter and surgical ablation alone. Surgery, including the full Cox maze procedure, although very effective, is very invasive and does need heart-lung bypass machine and an arrested heart. Catheter ablation is limited by the anatomy of the heart and the limitations of the energy sources used for catheter ablation. We believe that hybrid ablation, which combines both a minimally invasive thoracoscopic approach 
as well as a minimally invasive endocardial approach can overcome some of these obstacles. Hyperdiblation combines a minimally invasive epicardial or outside the heart ablation with a catheter-based endocardial or inside the heart ablation to surmount some of these obstacles. If you imagine the heart as a piece of hamburger meat, in order to get a full penetration of the cooking, one would have to go from both sides. Here in this diagram is a surgical instrument ablating from the outside of the heart. And that would be followed later by a catheter ablation to get the inside of the heart and therefore get a full lesion across the thickness of the tissue. This is important in order to completely block electrical signals thought to be responsible for atrial fibrillation. The details of this figure aren't necessarily important for the layperson. However, it does represent a diagram that shows most of the lesions of a full Cox maze procedure can be performed if necessary. We don't often do the full lesion set because this approach still is limited somewhat by the technology. This is what the surgical portion of this procedure looks like. You can see that the incisions are small. We use a very small endoscopic camera in the middle port, and the other access incisions give us access to the entirety of the outside of the heart. In my approach, I do this through a single side. Occasionally, going to both sides of the chest are necessary given anatomic constraints from the patient. This is what it looks like in the operating room. It's a calm environment. Everything is minimally invasive. Everything is seen on a screen, just like the one in the middle of the picture, and there is no heart-lung bypass machine. A very important part of this procedure is the ability to manage the left atrial appendage. This is the outpouching that sits on the left side of the heart on top of the atrium, where we believe most of the clots that are responsible for stroke are formed. An important part of this procedure is to completely isolate this appendage. This is a real shot of a video during surgery. The first step is to measure the size of the appendage. Once we have that measured, a custom size clip can be picked and positioned across the appendage itself. We take very careful measure to make sure the entirety of the appendage is obliterated with this clip. You can see us checking for the base of the appendage in this video. The final step is to deploy the clip partially. You will see the clip close momentarily. At this point, we check with ultrasound to make sure that the appendage is completely occluded, and then we fully deploy the clip. The results of hybrid ablation for atrial fibrillation are quite good. This is the paper that describes the longest uh, experience in the world at the moment. You can see that whether you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the kind that is always there or the kind that comes and goes, the results are similar. At three years, 80% of all patients in this study of 64 patients were free from their atrial fibrillation and off of their antiarrhythmic drugs. This slide represents the experience at Stanford over the first five years of my practice. The available follow-up is uh, there for two years for 84 patients total. Some of these patients, 13, were unable to complete their endocardial ablation, that is their inside catheter ablation, due to other risk factors, such as bleeding in the brain that precluded their ability to receive blood thinners for the catheter portion. Our patient population represents a fairly complex patient population. Most of our patients are older. Most of them are morbidly obese. They have diabetes. They have heart failure. They have good risk factors, or a lot of risk factors for stroke. They've had their atrial fibrillation for almost seven years on average. And most of them were in the category of persistent or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. That is, they were in atrial fibrillation all the time. And as you can see, a full third of them had already undergone a catheter ablation. These patients also had chronic kidney disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, some coronary artery disease, some heart failure, and many patients had sleep apnea. Most of these patients had enlarged left atria, a risk factor for recurrence after any kind of ablation. With this complex patient population in mind, our results are still very good. You can see at 12 months that the success rate is over 80% for patients off of their antiarrhythmic drugs and free from atrial arrhythmia recurrence. 
This was true whether or not they had a bilateral approach, BVAP, or a left-sided only approach, LVAP. For those patients that had the left-sided approach only, there is a significant benefit in terms of their post-operative pain. You can see that the average length of stay dropped by over two days for those patients that had a single-sided approach. And almost none of these patients required intensive care unit of stays. For those patients that were only able to undergo the surgical portion, the results are not quite as good. Therefore, we always recommend that patients come in for their catheter ablation, whether or not they feel like they are free from their atrial arrhythmia. You can see at 12 months that the success rate is only 75%. However, two of those patients were still on antiarrhythmic drugs. Therefore, the true success rate was only approached 50%. In summary, hybrid ablation is an excellent option for those challenging patients that don't need other heart surgery. We believe that the future care of all arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation, should follow the lead of collaboration seen in other areas of heart disease, such as aortic valve disease. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for sharing how hybrid ablation may be an excellent option for some patients. As a recap, it combines two minimally invasive approaches, overcoming some limitations from the other approaches. It's very encouraging that at 12 months, the success of it rate is over 80% for patients off of their anaerobic drugs and free from atrial fibrillation recurrence. Also a key benefit is a reduction or elimination in the need for intensive care unit stays, reduced hospital recovery time, and less post-operative pain. And now I'd like to introduce our special guest, Mr. Silas Richardson, a patient of Dr. Longoria's. We invited Mr. Richardson to share a brief glimpse into his story of how he discovered he had his AFib, his journey to find the right treatment solution, and how atrial fibrillation surgery with Dr. Longoria gave him his life back. Mr. Richardson had the hybrid surgical catheter ablation procedure, which consists of two procedures. First, the surgical thoracoscopic procedure and a separate second procedure, the catheter ablation procedure, both of which are minimally invasive and do not require open heart surgery. You'll hear that he had AFib after his first procedure, but none after his second pr procedure. So let's see what Mr. Richardson has to say. Hello, my name is Silas Richardson. I'm a patient of Dr. Longoria's. Uh, my story started uh, June of 2020. I was working part-time at Home Depot. Uh, as the days progressed, I wasn't feeling well, getting more tired, uh, going up and down the ladders was getting to be a chore. And when I got home, even going out to the mailbox got to be a chore. I'd get winded just going out to the mailbox. So I, I, I think it's probably time to go and see my doctor and see what's going on. COVID was hot and heavy back in the summer and I thought maybe it had something to do with that or anxiety. So I talked to my doctor, I made an appointment. Uh, went in, uh, checked my blood pressure, it was fine. Uh, about 10 minutes later, she came in with a very disturbed look on her face saying, Mr. Richardson, you're in full blown AFib and I need to send you to the hospital in an ambulance right now. And I said, whoa, 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 stop. And she explained to me what was going on. I said, well, please just let me call my wife and let her take me to the hospital. Uh, she relented, she let me do that. So my wife came and picked me up and took me to the emergency room. Uh, once we got into the emergency room, uh, I was admitted right away. Um, they were trying different cocktails of drugs to try to get my um, rhythm back uh, to normal. Uh, none of it with any success. So my third day in ICU, my first cardiologist, Dr. Sai, came in and said, we're going to do a procedure where we shock your heart back into rhythm. So we went to that procedure. They tried four different times and it didn't work. That's when uh, Dr. Muratikhan came in. He's a new doctor, uh, my second cardiologist. He's the one that recommended um, Dr. Langoria to me. He said he's uh, got a new procedure that he invented that is working really well, and I'd like you to go see him. So next thing I did was go and see uh, Dr. Langoria's team. Uh, we talked about my, my case, uh, what we were gonna do about it. Uh, he explained to me his procedure and how he invented this particular procedure. And now he's had a lot of success with that. Um, we agreed to that. Um, we did all the testing. Finally, on uh, July 7th, I went in for my surgery. Uh, 
Um, it was again during the COVID time. So you kind of go in all by yourself. Uh, my wife and family were actually waiting in the parking lot through the entire procedure. During the procedure, I understand that uh, Sarah, his um, per staff person that dealt with me the most was going out to give my wife uh, constant updates about how the surgery is going. And then after the surgery, Dr. Langori himself actually went out and talked to my family and explained how well the surgery had gone and what the next steps were going to be. So finally, the fourth day, um, all my tubes and stuff are pretty much extracted now, except for an IV, uh, felt really good. And uh, they said it was time to go home. So at that point, I went home. Um, it was pretty beat up. I mean, it's a little more extensive surgery than uh, I thought it would be. I had a little bit of a setback uh, seven days later. Uh, my heart back, went back into AFib. I had to go back to the hospital to have that ch um, checked. And uh, I had to have an electric procedure to get my heart back into rhythm. Uh, that was seven days after the surgery. And then again, seven days later after the surgery, I had to have it again. So uh, it's part of the heart healing process, I guess. And um, it was fairly easy to get through, a little scary, but once I got through that, it was fine. Um, weeks later, I had uh, the ablation procedure with Dr. Marticon. Um, everything seemed to go well there. Beginning of November, I was able to um, get off all of my meds. I had my last echo and it was all, all clean. Uh, as far as he was concerned, my heart was healed. Um, it was between 95 and 90 percent efficiency. Uh, even some of the things that were wrong with it before have increased a little bit. Um, my blood pressure has been well controlled since this has all started. Um, I just can't thank uh, Dr. Langori and his team enough for all they did, for all the information they gave us, uh, for keeping us um, abreast about what was going on all the time. But the level of care I got from uh, Dr. Langori's team was, was better than I've had so overall, it was a great experience. Like I said, as of November 1st, I'm uh, off of all the drugs that are related to AFib. And uh, I've been uh, getting better and better every day. And right now I feel great. I'm gonna go back to work part-time in another month or two and uh, go on living my life. We're so glad that Mr. Richardson is doing so well and we appreciate him taking the time to share his story with you. And we hope to remind you to seek care when you need it, without delay. If you'd like to speak to someone here about this approach and whether you're a strong candidate, please click the Connect With Us button and fill out the short form to be connected in the coming days by one of our team. And again, if you have any questions from, from any of the presentations, please use the chat box to write at the right of your screen and share with us in advance of the Q&A session which will be coming right up after our next speaker. And now I'd like to introduce our final speaker today, Dr. Melissa Burroughs, who will discuss lifestyle modifications in preventing and managing atrial fibrillation. Hi, I'm Dr. Melissa Burroughs, and I will discuss lifestyle modification for the prevention of atrial fibrillation. When I approach lifestyle modification with my patients, I first like to start with assessing the motivation for the patient in terms of changing certain aspects of their lifestyle. Some patients are more motivated to change their diet, while others are more motivated to increase exercise. And it's very important to start with the patient's priorities first. I personalize my approach knowing that one size does not fit all and everyone's lifestyle is different. And I like to take a holistic approach. I don't just focus on few aspects such as diet and exercise, but think about their overall lifestyle, including their workplace, their household, stress management, and sleep. I also like to focus on wellness because preventing illness is not our only objective. We want to make sure that they have optimal health so that they can feel great doing the activities of their life. The American Heart Association emphasized the importance of lifestyle modification in the treatment of atrial fibrillation in a recent scientific statement. They noted that lifestyle modification, including diet, exercise, and weight loss, was in the prevention of atrial fibrillation supported by multiple studies, including clinical observational studies and clinical trials. In addition to preventing progression of atrial fibrillation in patients who are conservatively managed, we know that lifestyle modification also improves outcomes in patients who are aggressively managed with catheter ablation. 
increased cardiopulmonary fitness associated with better outcomes and decreased recurrence of atrial fibrillation after ablation. And I'd like to emphasize that it's not just weight loss, but also exercise and cardiopulmonary fitness that, that promote cardiac remodeling and improve outcomes in atrial fibrillation. For patients who need additional resources in losing weight, Stanford has a host of resources, including nutrition counseling, the non-surgical weight loss clinic, and also surgical weight loss, loss clinic to offer bariatric surgery for patients who need it. I also discuss diet in my office for patients who are highly motivated and don't necessarily need in-depth nutritional counseling. We discuss the heart healthy diets that are proven to promote heart health, including the Mediterranean diet and the whole food plant-based diet. Now, while, while not every patient is motivated to completely remove animal proteins from their diet, it's important to note that increasing consumption of fruit, vegetables, and whole grains has an anti-inflammatory effect that improves overall health, but specifically heart health. I also like to discuss alcohol consumption in this in patients with atrial fibrillation, which is different than the recommendations we have for patients with coronary artery disease. Moderate alcohol consumption, which is one drink per day for a woman, two drinks per day for men, is associated with decreased risk of coronary artery disease. However, for patients with atrial fibrillation, even moderate alcohol consumption is associated with increased recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So I'd like to emphasize, while no amount of alcohol is safe for patients with atrial fibrillation in terms of minimizing their risk of recurrence, that light alcohol consumption can often be tolerated with one to two drinks per week. I also like to emphasize sleep, which is often overlooked. Not only are patients with obstructive sleep apnea at increased risk of recurrent atrial fibrillation, but also patients who have insomnia, specifically short sleep duration. I often refer my patients to the Stanford Comprehensive Sleep Center so that their insomnia can be addressed, whether it's trouble falling asleep or waking up in the middle of the night and trouble going back to sleep. I also like to emphasize the importance of decreasing exposure to smoke. Exposure to smoke of any type is pro-inflammatory and can increase risk of atrial fibrillation recurrence. Tobacco use is associated with increased atrial fibrillation. So for those who are smoking tobacco, we often recommend that they quit Exposure to secondhand smoke is also uh, associated with increased risk of recurrent atrial fibrillation. So we have to assess folks who live in the household or coworkers who may be smoking near the patient. And we also like to address ambient air pollution exposure. Exposure to ambient air pollution from either traffic sources, industrial sources, or from wildfire smoke is associated with increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Especially during fire season, I have my patients take measures to either minimize their time outdoors or to wear masks to protect themselves from smoke exposure. Thank you for joining me. And now I'll pass it on back to Dr. Wong. I'd like to thank Dr. Burroughs for sharing how lifestyle changes can help manage or even prevent atrial fibrillation. It's important to know that lifestyle modification, including diet, exercise, and weight loss have been shown in studies to improve the outcomes in patients who are impacted by heart disease. As Dr. Burroughs notice, notes, it's important to look at the patient holistically, not just how they are when they're visiting us in our office, but the factors in their day-to-day -day life, their home, their habits. In working with our doctors and participating in some of the programs we offer, patients can make a huge impact on their health. Now it's time to turn to your questions. I'd like to welcome all of our doctors to join me live on our screen so we can answer as many of your questions as we can. If you have a question and haven't already entered it in the chat, we encourage you to enter it now. You'll find the chat box loaded, located just to the right of this screen. Thank you for all of those who've been posting questions throughout the event. We appreciate you sharing your questions with us and we'll try to best to get through as many as we can. If your question is not related to the presentation, such as scheduling of appointments or to learn more about our programs, please use the connect with us button below the screen. Now let's get started. Great, uh, here's our expert panel. Uh, I'm gonna turn uh, to Dr. Burroughs and ask her one of the first questions. And that is, 
Uh, can you talk about dietary changes, eating a plant-based diet, uh, which might have reduced uh, atrial fibrillation and reduce the adverse effects of that condition? Dr. Burroughs. Great. Well, thank you for that question. That's a really good question. So a whole food plant-based diet really emphasizes minimally processed food, whole grains, fruit, vegetables, and minimizes exposure to animal protein, which includes dairy, cheese, milk, and also meats, um, which also includes, you know, when I say meat, I don't just mean beef and pork, but also chicken and fish. And some of my patients are not ready to make such a radical lifestyle change, and some are. So we kind of assess where they are. And some patients, it, rather than completely eliminate animal protein, they'd rather minimize it. So first, it may be a few times a day, and then later they may have a flexitarian diet where they're only eating animal protein maybe on the weekends. And that, for many people, is an easier change than to go completely plant-based. Um, and as because the plant-based diet is not only heart healthy, but also is uh, anti-inflammatory, and the recent data from Harvard School of Public Nurses Health Study that also support um, the heart benefits of an anti-inflammatory diet, we often see not only um, improvements in blood pressure and some of the risk factors for atrial fibrillation, also you can have weight loss, but also, you know, lifestyle change and also reduce the symptoms and recurrence. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Burroughs. Uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, the question is, how do I know if I have AFib? How do I decide if I need an ablation? And does AFib get worse with time? Dr. Gupta. Great questions. I'm going to uh, briefly answer that because it's a very complicated uh, question or series of questions. Uh, first of all, do you have atrial fibrillation? So, Symptoms uh, can be very variable, like we discussed with atrial fibrillation. Some of them are more um, uh, intuitive, like palpitations. If you feel the heart beating rapidly and erratically, and you know, you'd get evaluated with your doctors, that may be a stronger clue that you have atrial fibrillation. Other symptoms, like lower energy, shortness of breath, those can have many causes. So part of the evaluation would probably include an evaluation of your heart rhythm, and that's a common way that atrial fibrillation gets diagnosed. Um, like we mentioned, a lot of people with AFib don't have any symptoms. So uh, that often gets picked up on routine screening or other medical contacts with your doctor. So at the end of the day, your uh, medical team with you will assess your symptoms and do routine care to diagnose your atrial fibrillation. Um, Paul, can you remind me of that second half of that question? Uh, let's see, uh, how do I determine whether I need ablation? That, that one or, uh, okay. let's see. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of ablation, um, the main focus with strategies to reduce AFib and get people back into normal rhythm is usually related to symptoms. So people who are symptomatic and not feeling with AFib, we take multiple strategies to try to get them out of AFib. And that's, again, this many different pronged approach. We talked about lifestyle modification, medications and in people who um, are good candidates, ablation, including uh, hybrid surgical approaches and catheter ablation. So we take a multi-prong approach. Uh, great, thanks Dr. Gupta. Uh, Dr. Longoria, uh, the question is, I used to have more common AFib because of rheumatic heart disease. I had two heart valve replacements in warfarin. My question is, although my atria are now longer, are now no longer functioning mechanically, my heart remains in sinus. Will it con continue to beat normally? Uh, thank you for that question. I think that it's it's difficult to predict who is going to remain in sinus rhythm versus who will develop atrial fibrillation. We, you know, we've talked about all of the risk factors in terms of developing atrial fibrillation. If you've already had prior heart surgery, a third of all heart surgery patients, even if you have no prior history of atrial fibrillation, develop atrial fibrillation afterward. So having rheumatic uh, heart disease and two valves um, and you're in sinus rhythm, at this time you can just do all of the lifestyle modifications that Dr. Burroughs discussed uh, in terms of trying to prevent uh, you from going into atrial fibrillation. Uh, thanks, Dr. Longoria. Uh, I'm gonna ask another question. This is to Dr. Lee. Um, do any of these procedures in your presentation apply to a person who has had atrial fibrillation because of mitral valve regurgitation? 
That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, for sure, any of these procedures can be used in the setting of mitral valve disease. Mitral valve disease does make it a little bit more difficult to treat. We believe that some of the back pressure from a leaky mitral valve does make the risk of recurrence a little bit higher. But certainly, if um, you have symptoms related to your atrial fibrillation, then you should probably get it treated. Uh, it does set up a very nice situation for surgeons like myself and Dr. Longoria. If you have severe leakage of your mitral valve, there is always an indication to have that repaired, even if you don't have symptoms. The uh, reason for that is the earlier you repair a severely leaking mitral valve, the better your survival afterwards. And I believe uh, everybody on the panel here believes that at the time of surgery, if you have an open atrium, then you really should have your atrial fibrillation treated at the same time. There's certainly a, an improvement of quality of life after treating uh, atrial fibrillation surgically. And uh, anytime you have surgery, subsequent treatment that might be invasive is always much harder due to the scar tissue that happens after surgery. So that's an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Natalie. Uh, I'll take a few of these. Uh, one is, how likely is an atrial attack to lead to stroke or heart attack during the episode or in the long term? And does age play a factor? And so the answer is um, in the scoring system that Dr. Gupta beautifully described, uh, age is felt to have a major impact in predicting outcomes uh, like uh, stroke. Uh, the next question is, uh, once you have an AFib episode, is another likely? Is AFib permanent or episodic? And as Dr. Gupta mentioned, AFib can be paroxysmal, coming and going, or it can be uh, what we call a persistent. It stays for a while until it gets corrected. So it can be either one. Uh, is, is flecainide a medication safe and effective in treating atrial fibrillation? So it is a commonly used medication, one of the medications Dr. Gupta talked about, uh, an anarrhythmic medication. And it's used in patients that do not have uh, structural heart disease like coronary artery disease or a uh, weakened heart. Uh, I'm gonna go back to Dr. Burroughs. Uh, the question we have for her is um, a recent research finding uh, that persons with AFib increase their chances of stroke by having uh, one glass of beer or wine a day with dinner. Uh, can this be true? Dr. Burroughs. So that's a really good question, actually. So, you know, what I talked about in my talk was more about atrial fibrillation recurrence with alcohol versus, um, a, you know, stroke would be a, a different outcome. I'm not familiar with that specific study and data, so I can't speak to it. Um, but I will say that, you know, atrial, that all, any amount of alcohol intake does increase your risk of recurrence. So specifically for peroxidal fibrillation, then, you know, if you are drinking alcohol regularly, even if it is light alcohol, it can increase your chances of having another episode of atrial fibrillation. And then being in atrial fibrillation does, in fact, increase your risk of stroke. And so it's likely that's what the data are reflecting. Uh, thanks, Dr. Burroughs. Uh, I'm going to turn to Dr. Longorio. Uh, this is about Mr. Richardson. Uh, the comment is, hearing Mr. Richardson's story sounds a bit scary. Is there, are there always setbacks with uh, either of the parts of the procedure? No, I think one of the things about uh, setbacks is uh, I've seen the gamut because we've done so many of these now of patients that have actually been uh, discharged the first day, um, some that have had a slightly prolonged uh, hospitalization. Uh, but really, uh, setbacks occur uh, there's a blinking period, what we call a blinking period that all of us know about. It's the first three months after any type of ablation, either catheter or surgical ablation, where we try to ignore any recurrences because we have to allow healing uh, for the heart after the ablation. And so some patients just sail right through that blinking period without ever having a recurrence. And some have uh, some recurrence like Mr. Richardson did, where he had to have uh, two card versions. But um, the thing to remember about his story is uh, cardioversion was attempted prior to any ablation before and didn't work at all and obviously worked uh, afterward prior to his uh, second procedure. So, uh, yeah, actually. Uh, thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, um, uh, the question is, do you think the results of hybrid ablation are better than catheter ablation and why? That's a tricky question in the setting of uh, my colleagues, but I think they will agree that hybrid ablation is very useful for those subset of patients that have a lot of risk factors for recurrence. And I did allude to some of those in my slides. 
uh, particularly long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, those patients that have had it for a year continuously or more, those certainly are very difficult to treat with a single catheter ablation alone. I think the appealing thing to hybrid catheter ablation is that it reduces the number of procedures that we think you'll need. Uh, there are some centers that do everything in one sitting, uh, meaning both the outside and inside ablation. We don't tend to do that because it can uh, end up being a very, very long day for the patient under general anesthesia. So we've gone to separating the two procedures so that the uh, actual duration of the procedure is shorter. But certainly, um, I think we view that the more invasive the procedure, typically it's more effective, but only for those patients that have those risk factors that we think make them uh, not as good candidates for the less invasive procedures. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lee. Uh, back to Dr. Gupta. Um, the question is, how many times can I get a cardioversion? It, it failed for me. Should I try again, uh, Dr. Gupta? Thank you. That's a great question. So, yes, we have patients who have had multiple cardioversions, and as long as we take steps to do the cardioversion properly, the risk of that is low, so people can have multiple cardioversions. Fundamentally, though, if you're having recurrent episodes of atrial fibrillation and require more than one cardioversion, that's usually a very good sign that we need to be more aggressive with the therapy to prevent atrial fibrillation in the first place. Again, going back to lifestyle, medications, and ablation approaches. So again, um, we wanna to try to minimize cardioversions in the first place. Thanks, Dr. Gupta. Um, let's see, um, uh, Dr. Burroughs, uh, maybe you could take these two questions. How do you feel about, their, about uh, Dr. Carolyn Dean's suggestion about using magnesium? And does increased calcium contribute to AFib? That's a good question. Um, so um, in, I will say patients who have low serum magnesium, which is not that common, um, uh, then we do want them to be you know, at normal levels because you can't have more arrhythmias in general. So for most outpatient, not undergoing, you know, rapid volume shifts. It's not that common to have, um, you know, low, you know, low magnesium blood. And in terms of calcium, so I'm not familiar with any data about calcium supplementation and um, atrial fibrillation. Most of my conversations about calcium supplementation are more for coronary artery disease. There is some concern that um, high doses of calcium supplements can increase calcification of um, arteries and, and atherosclerosis. And so we do talk about that as often a risk benefit ratio and the indication and how strongly the patient needs the supplementation. Uh, thanks, Dr. Burroughs. Uh, Dr. Longorio, uh, how successful is cardioversion after surgical valve repair uh, if one's still in atrial fibrillation, uh, Dr. Longorio? Uh, it's actually uh, fairly successful. Again, if you have mitral valve repair and didn't have atrial fibrillation or develop atrial fibrillation postoperatively, you know, then you should probably be referred, uh, you know, to someone like uh, Dr. Long or Dr. Gupta and be evaluated in terms of what's the best way to treat that besides lifestyle modification medications and possibly ablative, you know, catheter ablation. You know, hopefully the surgeon at the time dealt with the left atrial appendage and did left atrial appendage exclusion. Uh, to decrease your long-term risk for stroke at that time. So it's uh, highly successful uh, once you're out of the kind of uh, remodeling period, healing period of, of your heart. Uh, thanks, Dr. Bjorg. Uh, for Dr. Lee, um, the question is, hybrid convergent surgical ablation clipping of the left atrial appendage versus catheter ablation, which should be done first and why? That really depends on your uh, situation. Uh, like I said in the prior answer, I think most people would prefer a less invasive procedure. Uh, obviously, the less invasive, the easier it is for you to recover. Uh, it really depends on how many risk factors you have for recurrence. Uh, if you have a lot, for example, you have obstructive sleep apnea, you've had atrial fibrillation for 10 years, you're always in atrial fibrillation, maybe you've had a couple of cardioversions that uh, at first lasted for a while and then now only last you a couple uh, days or even an hour or maybe even until you walk back to the parking lot. Those are the sorts of patients that we treat with the more invasive options. Regarding that convergent procedure, uh, it certainly is another form of hybrid procedure. Um, we shy away from it a little bit because uh, it is a surgical procedure, but 
the data certainly show, the preliminary data show, that the uh, results are not as good as the thoracoscopic procedure. Uh, typically, the uh, thoracoscopic procedure is a little bit more technically difficult for the typical cardiac surgeon, and the convergent procedure is somewhat of a compromise. Uh, and certainly, as a patient, you don't want your care to be compromised. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lee. Uh, I think we're almost at the end of our session. I'm going to take a few very quickly. Uh, should you continue to take blood thinners when you're in normal rhythm? And so that based on, is based on the CHAZ-VAS score. So frequently, yes. Um, it, having AFib, I'm more likely to have, atrial, uh, have heart failure. So some patients can develop that. Um, and does the heart restore itself over time? Uh, it can do that, but usually we have to help it restore and get back to normal rhythm. And one question is, that I'm 88, is any procedure too, am I too frail? And that's an individual decision. Uh, some of our patients are, you know, really are very suitable candidates for different procedures. So uh, that's something we're going to need to be able to uh, consider. So um, what a wonderful session. Uh, thank you. So on behalf of my colleagues, myself, and everyone at Stanford Medicine, we'd like to thank you for your attention today. I hope you found that the information about atrial fibrillation was valuable and you feel confident about knowing your options and what you can start doing today. Stanford Medicine offers all AFib uh, treatments at all our locations throughout our network in the California Bay Area and beyond. If you're interested in scheduling an appointment or learning more about our program, please, please, use, please use the connect with us button below this video. For those who have RSVP'd and are watching live, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording and short survey. We would appreciate hearing your feedback about today's event and how Stanford Medicine continues to bring you information about how to better serve your health. If you didn't RSVP and wish to receive the email, please use the Connect With Us button to share us the with us the information so we can start informing you about upcoming programs. And finally, I'd like to express my appreciation to my colleagues for their robust content and discussion, to Mr. Silas Richardson for sharing his journey to cure his AFib, and especially to you, our viewers, for sharing with us your time, watching this presentation, asking such great questions. To close out this virtual event, I want to encourage everyone to be proactive about your heart health and to seek appropriate care. Happy Heart Month.